This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making from two Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. And welcome to episode 181, and this is for our third year, our third year in review episode. It's incredible, three years has gone by so fast, but this is the episode where we select portions of some of the guest interviews we've had and we weave together a, a brief summary of how we view 2021 on the podcast. And this this year we have 46 segments to share. So how would you describe 2021? Uh, it's t- tough to describe it in a sentence, but it was it was quite a year for for the podcast and I mean also for our business, which of, of course is behind um, everything that we're that we're doing that's people that have been listening from the from the very beginning know that the genesis of the podcast was uh, an outlet for us to communicate with our clients and it's just kind of grown into something <laughs> something greater than that um, yeah, for sure yeah but I mean some of the stats we'll talk about on in terms of the growth of the podcast are, are pretty I mean staggering really well, yeah we never would have guessed when we started this three plus years ago, for sure. Um, speaking of guests, we want to let everybody know that we're going to have a 2021 guest mug, much like last year's guest mug, where all the guests and the episode numbers are, are on the side of the mug. Pretty cool new design that, that we've got coming too. So watch for that. It should be out by the time this uh, episode airs. So the kind of the story that's weaved with all of these different segments is basically it starts with, you know, life's purpose, meaning, which I think was a big theme of this year. Then we get into goal setting, time, happiness, money values, retirement, market efficiency, factors, value premiums, profitability, bonds, inflation, skewness, crypto, CAPE, spending, flexibility, and retirement. And then we finish off with living an abundant life. So for those regular listeners, none of these topics will surprise you, but hopefully you'll find some value in having all of these, these segments attached together in a bit of a storyboard. And I mean, it, it, it also reflects like what, what's new, what, what, what are, what are the new things that people are going to learn from listening to this? I mean, a lot of these clips reflect, uh, things that changed our perspective or we found enlightening throughout the year. So hopefully the fact that we're highlighting some of these things um, and plus we're giving commentary as we as we go through them as well. So by the numbers, these some of these numbers, as you said earlier, are pretty crazy. So for 2021, so this year, the podcast has been downloaded almost 1.3 million times. That's a 55% increase over 2020. YouTube views, so 336,000 times this year versus 140 in 2020, a 25% increase. 250% increase, right? Yeah. So we had uh, four AMAs this year with Larry Swedro, Wes Gray, Jack Vogel, and Paul Merriman. All were very, first of all, a lot of fun to do, to, yeah. to do them live and to interact with the audience live it was super fun. Yeah. Why don't you talk about the community since you're a lot more active there than I am? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's at almost 6,000 users now. Um, most of that growth of about 4,800 of those users signed up in calendar year 2021. So huge growth in the Rational Reminder community. Uh, on average, 109 engaged users per day. So that's people actively posting and participating in, in discussions and about 500 uh, visitors per day on average. That's people that are just uh, viewing uh, viewing the, the community. But tr- tremendous growth, tons of activity. Uh, and it's, you kind of notice it online, more, more people are identifying this as a place to go to have really mm-hmm. good high quality discussions about these topics. I mean, uh, Bogle had spent many years and it still is a great community, but it spent many years being the, the place to go um, but it's, I think, difficult to manage a community when it gets to, to be such a, such a large size. And uh, I, I think it's uh, the, the, the smaller nature of the Rational Reminder community has made it a really good place to go. Mm-hmm. 
in the merchandise store, we had 339 orders so far this year. So pretty busy in the store. And uh, also want to take take time as we do every year and just to thank the incredible team that that puts out this podcast each week because it is a ton of work by a lot of people. So on the PWL side, we really want to give a good shout out to Angelica Montagano, who's our digital marketing lead. You've probably seen Angelica at our AMA events or perhaps chat with her in the community. So big shout out to Angelica. Martin Delaire, who is our head of marketing communications. Sandrine Dugray, who's our digital marketing coordinator. So you've probably seen an improvement in our social media posts lately, especially on Instagram. And you've also probably noticed some improvements if you follow our YouTube channel. So shout out to Matt Gambino, who's our multimedia specialist here at PWL. Beautiful work on, on those, uh, those productions. And last but not least, want to give a shout out to Karen Deland, who is our chief compliance officer. So every week she has to uh, in, uh, review every every post and every podcast we put out. So uh, thanks to Corinne. Okay. Corinne listens also, to every episode. And, uh, yeah. At the time that we're recording, all, all the uh, Spotify wrapped uh, little animation things have been coming out. I don't, I don't know if Corinne uses Spotify, but if she does, we're, we're probably <laughs> her, we're probably her top podcast. Uh, we also want to thank our amazing producer. So Matthew Passy at the podcast consultant, if, you are out there and considering a podcast and having a producer will make your life much easier. And Ben and I can't recommend Matt enough. He's fantastic to work with. He has a whole team and does fabulous work. And we're very grateful to Matt. Also want to thank Shannon Rojas, who is the chief operating officer at the podcast consultant. And she's instrumental in making sure that all the different parts that go into making a podcast, keep moving and keep moving along. So thanks to them. Also want to thank Jennifer Beldum at Northern Craft, which is our supplier of merchandise. Want to give a special shout out to Sachin and his great company, Eversocks. So Sachin reached out to us a little over two years ago and uh, suggested we offer socks to our audience. So he and his team did up a great design, gave us a good price, and we have given out so many rash reminder socks. It's incredible. I think we're on our third or fourth order now of socks. Uh, great people at University of Chicago Financial Education Initiative who helped us get the Rational Reminder branded Talking Sense cards available in Canada. So with them produced in Canada, it makes them a lot cheaper um, and more affordable to get out to everybody. So we, uh, again, we are second order coming in soon. We've shipped out over 200 decks, if you can believe it. Unreal. And the second order is on its way in. Uh, I want to thank our friend Trevor May, who created the original music for the podcast. I know some people said it's sometimes a little bit loud, but hey, we like it. People also say yeah. that it's that it's Canadian though, so that's it that's is very good. it's a very Canadian Canadian track. Uh, probably most of all, though, we want to thank everyone for listening and watching. That's what that's why we do it all. It's, it's tremendous fun for Ben and I. So, thanks to you. Uh, we're off next week, so you got two weeks to listen to this episode. But we are back in the new year. We have an incredible conversation on January 6th with Mac McQuown. And then two weeks after that, we uh, have Robin w Wigglesworth in, who is the author of Trillions. And that's a cool combo because Mac, as you'll hear, is the godfather, so to speak, of index funds. So we hear Mac, and then uh, a couple of weeks after that, Robin tells us the, the, the full story from sort of beginning to end of index funds, including Mac, but it just gives you additional context for how, uh, how important the conversation we have with Mac is. Yeah, I don't think we could have bookended it any better. It's yeah. really good back to back to kick off uh, 2022. Ben, anything else? No, I think that's good. Let's, uh, let's go ahead to the episode. Welcome to episode 181 of the Rational Reminder podcast, our third year-end wrap-up episode. So to kick off this year's episode, I mean, every conversation we have has a certain impact on us, but one in particular this year brought me back to the reason why we do what we do as part of our day jobs and frankly why I've been doing it for so long. And it was pretty cool this past year to connect with Bill Schulteis People who heard that episode 
heard me tell a story about how reading Bill's book way back when the Coffeehouse Investor had such an influence on me. And I used to read his blog every single week as it came out. Anyway, so reach out. We had a great chat with him. He was quite complimentary about the, the work that you and I have been doing. And I just thought how we talked about finding and funding a good life and what is a rich life, which is such a good place to, to kick off this episode. For me, a rich life means, and I have a quote by a philosopher in my first book that kind of sums it all up. It means um, finding a place at which your passions and interests intersect with the needs of the world. And then moving forward in your life so that when you wake up every day, you've got a purpose in life. And it doesn't have to be something that's grand. I mean, I have many stories in my second book of my mom who inspires so many people because she wakes up and she's kind to people. And when you move through life, I've got another story in my book about a bus driver who was so darned uplifting and the way she embraced her passengers, it changed people's lives. It changed my life. And, you know, we don't have to do these grand, these grand things, but when we find, you know, I've got, I mean, and I'm sure you've got the same stories for, for folks who are older getting on in their lives, their purpose in life is to be good examples to their grandchildren and to make sure that their grandchildren are doing the right things and making the right decisions. That's their purpose in life. And when you give someone the financial freedom to embrace those things, I mean, that, you know, for me, that's what gets me up every day. And I'm sure it's what gets you two up every day. Much of the purpose of the podcast is to help people make better decisions. However, perspective on what is important does shift over time. And the shifting of what's important makes making decisions even more difficult. So Hal Hirschfield from UCLA, I thought, had some great thoughts on this. People, people can get caught in, in the trap of setting long-term goals, thinking that they're going to live their, their rich life, as we just heard Bill, Bill talk about later. I'll be, I'll be happy later. I'll, I'll focus on myself later. But understanding who we are today and who we want to be in the future is really important in in living a good life today, uh, but also in figuring out what goals you should be setting for the future. And then you touched on it, Cameron. Pe- people don't know, you can't know who you're gonna be in the future. You can think about your future self and that helps, but you can't know who you're gonna be in the future. So we asked how, how people can make the right decisions to have more well-being. Well, th- first off, let me just commend you by saying, that last part is what's so important because I always think it's important to say, what do we mean by the right decisions, right? Because, you know, my right decision, you know, maybe my right decision is that I I need to have an 80% replacement ratio in order to feel satisfied in retirement. I don't know how I came up with that, but somehow I did, but someone else is going to say, no, 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 I don't need all that money in retirement. So what's most important is, can we first identify what's the right metric so that we, you know, can say, okay, well, what is, you know, a given person, what do I need? What does somebody else need? Some of the stuff we can't know, right? Um, and I, and I want to come back to that in a second. But um, I, I would say that one of the most important things that we can do here um, is to think a little bit more deeply about who we think we'll be in the future, who we want to be in the future, and what that future life will look like. And I mean that from the standpoint of what will we do? What will we be doing? Uh, where will we be living? Um, how much time do I want to have and do I need to have? These are really hard questions to answer, and I'm not suggesting that people are going to have the answers to them. But I think one of the problems that I've observed uh, anecdotally in the sort of financial advisory and financial decision-making space is that people set goals for the future. And we know this is you know such a common practice in the wealth management business. Let's see, what goal do you have? You know, When do you want to retire? Uh, how much money do you want to have? How many trips do you want to go on? But, but they set those goals before they really think about what life will look like and who they want to be from a more sort of um, holistic standpoint. Yep. And, 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 and my, you know, my question is, how meaningful are those goals if you've come up with them before you really had that conversation with, with your future self or with your future selves? You know, especially, I think a lot of these decisions are 
joint decisions, family decisions? What does life look like on the other side for my whole family? Um, so that, you know, that's one of the first um, pieces of advice I would give was, is, is to have that conversation, think about that self and, um, and, and think about all these other aspects of, of time and the trade-offs we want to have. Ashley Willens was another spectacular guest uh, this year. Uh, she was the author of the book Time Smart and is also a professor at Harvard. So time, I found, was a very popular topic uh, of discussions throughout 2021 and how time relates to happiness. So we asked Ashley what the relationship is between time poverty and well-being. So the reason I'm interested in studying it as a happiness researcher is that people who report feeling time poor also report lower levels of happiness, more stress, lower quality social relationships, are more likely to get divorced, less likely to exercise, less likely to eat healthy. My PhD students and I published a review paper in Nature Human Behavior last year documenting all the pernicious effects of the psychological experience of time poverty. And really, truly, there are many. Um, and it makes sense because if you feel overwhelmed by the demands of work and life, it's hard to disconnect, it's hard to check in, be present, exercise, cook well. And we can really see that in the data. In one data set, another different one that we analyzed of 3.1 million Americans, we found that time poverty had a stronger negative effect on happiness than being unemployed. So wow. we can see again that the effect sizes are not trivial when it comes to these feelings of stress. They've been on the rise all over the world, not just in the US, and they are coming at a cost to our happiness. When you start thinking about time poverty, you can't ignore technology. Technology adds to efficiency in our day-to-day -day lives. It makes us more productive. People today are unquestionably more productive than we were, than humans were 100 years ago, but it can also have a detrimental impact to the quality of our leisure time. We have more leisure time, but it may not be better leisure time, both because of technology. So we asked Ashley Willens about this as well. It's crazy to think about. So technology has given us more leisure time, but it's taken away, I guess, the quality of that leisure time. Yeah, social psychologists and organizational scholars call this paradox the autonomy paradox. So technology is supposed to free us from the office, and yet we take our offices everywhere we go. So although we have technically more freedom, we're also now under this assumption that we need to be more constantly responsive to work at all times of the day and night. The, the other interesting angle on time poverty is w whether you, you can thoroughly enjoy what you do for work and still be time poor. People spend a lot of time doing their jobs. Many people, like Cameron and I often talk about this, enjoy the work that they do. So there's an interesting question in there. If you love your job and spend a lot of time doing it, can you still suffer from the symptoms of time poverty? So again, we asked Ashley about this. So we do still see the effects of time stress, even for people who enjoy their work. And this is consistent with some evidence suggesting that even for people who love their jobs, when you start working 60 or 70 hours a week, it's still coming at the cost of other things that are important for happiness. Work is one facet of our lives. And there is many other factors that you need, proper sleep, health, social relationships, leisure that are critical for happiness. And so even if you love your job, if you're only focusing on that one element of your life, then it's unlikely you're going to reach your maximum happiness wow. and meaning potential because you're only allocating all of your energy to one aspect of your life. And it, usually that's coming at the expense of others. And at the other end of the spectrum is a view that even if you don't need to work, work offers so many benefits. So we talked to Jennifer Risher, who's the author of the book, We Need to Talk. And as you'll recall, she was an early employee at Microsoft and her husband was very early at Amazon. So they don't have a need to work. However, she shared some incredible thoughts on the role and importance and meaning of work. Yeah, there's another fantasy, like we always think, oh, if I didn't have to work, I'd sit on the beach <laughs> or I'd like go out with friends. It would be just so wonderful. And yeah, it, yeah, for a couple of weeks, it really is very nice. And I think the fantasy of not having to work, um, it's big in our minds too. But work gives us a lot and it places us in society. 
It gives us a reason to get up in the morning. It gives structure to our day. It gives us a camaraderie with our colleagues. It gives us goals to achieve, a sense of purpose and meaning. It, it's much more than just a paycheck. And I, I felt that right away. And when, when I left Microsoft, I, my identity was really wrapped up in work. And um, I realized how much I was getting from work and, and then not, not having work. It, it's it can be very challenging, especially when, you know, it's in the US, we they, we kind of define each other through our work. The, often the, the second question someone asks you is, what do you do? And, you know, what you do is is your work. And when you don't have that, it it, it, it can it can be more challenging than than we realize um, to 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 find that sense of purpose. Because I think, you know, where does happiness come from? It does come from feeling a sense of purpose, making a difference, having meaning in your life. Um, it comes from being generous with other people. Uh, it comes from ultimately from the connections you have in your life and, and your work connections are, are part of that. That clip from Jennifer Richer makes me think of Happiness Hypothesis, uh, the book that I've talked about many times by Jonathan Haidt. He says in the book that love and work are crucial for human happiness because when they're done well, they draw us out of ourselves and into connection with people and projects beyond ourselves, which is, I think, what Jennifer was, was saying, or at least a big part of it. But the other thing that he's very careful to point out is that work is not necessarily the thing that you do to get a paycheck, which again, I think speaks to what Jennifer mm. was was saying his definition of work that he says in the book is the answer to the question, so what do you do? But he says like in his book, he gives the examples of a student or a full-time parent. Those are both examples of answer to the, to the answers to that question that aren't, you know, going to a job to earn a paycheck. So I think as much as we talk about the importance of work, we're not talking about having a job to pay the bills. That's a, an important distinction. Yeah, it's interesting to kind of bridge this with a discussion on values because we did talk about that to some degree this year and how you spend your time and your money is a reflection of your values. And th this may be a subject that a lot of people don't spend a ton of time thinking about. But however, when you're raising ch children, it's super important to realize that they are observing you. They're picking up on your values, whether it be do you work? How do you work? What habits do you have? And they're seeing the signals of your decisions all over the place, including how you spend your funds. It's definitely important with, with kids. And I see that in my, in my personal life, but I think just in a relationship, generally speaking, and Robin touches on this too, having clearly defined values, even if they're not the same between two partners in a relationship, knowing what each person values is a, is a pretty powerful idea that can anchor a lot of really important decisions. For sure. So we, we asked Robin Tobe, who's the author of the book, The Wisest Investment, Teaching Your Kids to Be Responsible, Independent, and Money Smart for Life. We asked her how important are family money values? Very. And that's my second strategy for parents. So the good one was be, the first was being a good role model. And the second one is, is to communicate and use your values to help guide and prioritize financial decisions. And I find values is sometimes overlooked or, you know, parent, you know, if you know what values are, it's the things that are most important to you that you're willing to take a stand for and that you hold dear. They're like your core at your core of who you are. And sometimes we just don't pay attention to them and we take it for granted, but they can really help. They're almost like an invisible fr framework to ground financial decisions and for parents to help pass on, uh, you know, the, the way they prioritize money decisions and how they set goals. So I think it's so important. And um, in my book, I have an exercise called the values validator, which is a, a way to tease out what your top values are. And I encourage parents to do it, partners to do it, and then you can compare and have your kids do it too and see where your values are, are the same, where they may be a bit different. Um, you know, what are the most important values that you want your kids to also have? We asked Jennifer Risher how she and her husband manage their family money values. And here was her response. Yeah, you know, I feel fortunate, even though Dave and I have slightly different views of money and ways of dealing with it, that we share common values and common goals. And I think that's, you know, what's 
you know, made it easy for us to navigate this because we, we pretty much agree on kind of where we want to be and what, how we want to walk through the world and, and live our lives. And, you know, it's hard in any relationship. It's a, it's a negotiation. And so, you know, our people, you know, when one person feels that they have enough and the other person doesn't, I mean, that's a, that's a tricky negotiation in, in a marriage, in any aspect of a marriage, right? Um, do you want to have another child or do you want to have children or, you know, do you want to go on vacation or do you not want to go on vacation? Do we need a second home? You know, I, all those kind of conversations are, are about values and what you care about and how you want to you know, live your life. Getting clear on your money values and your values more generally is, is a big step in the financial planning process. But even once we've figured that out and said, okay, we've got to save to achieve this objective that's aligned with our values, there are always going to be other competing forces at play, like spending, for example, in, in, the, in the savings scenario uh, that, that are going to make it challenging. It, it, based on that, it's kind of easy to push off the financial planning process. We'll, we'll figure it out later because it can be hard. So one of the things that we asked Katie Milkman about, she's the author of the book, How to Change, is what people can do to make saving money more fun. Yeah, it's a really, really great question. Um, when it comes to sort of maintaining and adhering and engaging in things that offer long-term benefits, but not so much short-term satisfaction. We always face an uphill battle because we are wired to overvalue instant gratification. We get more from that instant gratification dramatically. We overweight, it's called present bias relative to um, what, you know, imagining a comfortable retirement or the home you'll be able to buy your, for your family if you keep growing that nest egg, whatever it is, those things, they're discounted heavily and we overweight that, you know, today warm, fuzzy feeling we get from, um, spending on a trinket. Um, okay, so then the question is what to do, as you said. Uh, the, the classic answer that I focus on in the book that so much research of late has really supported is finding ways to actually bring some of the reward forward in time so that it's instantly gratifying to do what's good for you. So it's easy to see how to do this with something like going to the gym mm -hmm. uh, or studying right by um, associating it. Like I... I use a technique I call temptation bundling, where I only let myself binge watch my favorite TV shows, for instance, at the gym, or uh, listen to my favorite podcast while doing household chores, and that makes it fun in the moment. But that's kind of hard to think about. How do you temptation bundle with saving? There, I have heard of some cl clever strategies that people use to try to make saving more fun. So for instance, you could imagine making sure your accountant is someone you really, really like, bringing a bottle of wine, having a regularly scheduled meeting or having a nice restaurant. So there's something you look forward to about that interaction that will help you do your financial planning and setting aside. So there, there are ways to make it social, which is a way of making things fun um, to adhere to your goals uh, or to you know, save yourself a favorite, a small treat, some small reward, whether it's a donut from your favorite shop or some other kind, you know, a favorite TV show you save or a movie you watch once a year only after you've done your taxes. So there may be ways, but I'd say it's it's probably going to depend on the person. And really the principle is try to think of how you can make sure it's not all delayed gratification when you do the things that are good for you. Because if it's all delayed gratification, we tend not to persist on our goals, even though we think we will. We, we have this misperception that I can just push through and do the thing that's right. If it's not fun, we don't tend to persist. And so Anything you can find that will make the financial planning experience fun, whether it's doing it with friends or family, bringing in treats, uh, it's, worth, it's worth considering and trying to do. One of the biggest learnings for me in 2021 was about how difficult it is for people to imagine their future selves. So this makes the whole planning process so much more difficult as clearly current priorities will take priority over some unknown future self. So we asked Johanna Peets, who is a psychology professor here at Carleton University in Ottawa, how this distance to our future selves plays in the motivation to reach a future goal. I think it's great that you guys are doing this because I do think people need all the help they can get to plan that far in the future. Because for most people, these distant future selves are almost like strangers, right? So they, hard, they don't really see 
the point of saving for this distant future stranger that's not even doesn't even feel like they are that's them so yeah i do think you definitely need professional advice for that sort of thing and um what we found is in in that's outside of financial um behavior we found this in uh, academic goals and those kind of things mm. we found that the closer you are to academic goals the more motivated you are to pursue them right so it's much easier to pursue goals that are close in time than it is to pursue goals that are 60 years in the future mm. so um the further away it is the harder it is to get yourself motivated to do something towards it right now hmm. so obvious question what can you do to feel closer to those goals yeah uh one way one thing you can do and one thing that's been studied in uh, in various psych labs is to make these future selves more vivid so to really think about what will you look like then so there's like studies by hal hirschfield right to make people picture the future self uh, there's some recent work on writing letters to the future self so they're writing letters to the to the self that is in retirement realizing that it's themselves so talking in the in the first person and things like that so uh, anything that makes it more vivid more real that would also make it feel psychologically closer i mentioned bill schulteis off the top of the episode and another character from my early years was paul merriman so merriman financial was a leader in our field and i loved the image of their firm in the early days of, of websites, frankly, in our space, I thought it was so cool. Because remember, we talked about how, you know, I grew up in this business just as the internet was getting going. Anyway, so this podcast gave us a chance to reach out and invite Paul Merriman to, to join us. And what a gracious, nice guy. Like, I reached out to him by email, and he phoned me back within minutes. And he's just so nice and so decent. And he actually shared a pretty raw, raw and real story about his relationship with money and the concept of what is enough. So we asked him what he has learned throughout his life about the relationship between him and money and a life well lived. And I thought his answer was just spectacular. His answer is spectacular, but it comes from, he, he had financial success before starting his firm and then continued to have financial success after starting his firm and then had, a, had another liquidity event eventually when he, when he sold it. So his, he's, he's lived this. He's lived a life of having windfalls, uh, but he's also lived a life giving people financial advice. So his answer to this question is, it's absolutely fascinating and, and insightful. Well, that's a, that's, that's a tough one. I, um, I'll be as straight as I can uh, without exposing too many of my flaws. Uh, I was raised in a household where it wasn't particularly safe. Um, I had a father who I was totally afraid of, uh, I hated, I mean, I was a kid feeling hate. That was not an adult feeling hate. Wow. I thought was going to kill me. He never did, uh, and probably never intended to, but it felt like he was in his, on his mind. And it turned out he was my stepfather. And, uh, uh, I was probably a kind of an inconvenience for him in his life with my mother, who was absolutely amazing. Um, but, and I, I, by the way, I was very happy to find out he wasn't my father because it explained everything. <laughs> but, but the, but what came out of that with money was I did not trust um, my life. And I, I started thinking that money was the, salvation that would protect me from all things uh, evil in my life at a fairly young age. And I also, because of not wanting to be at home, found it um, most enjoyable to do other things in the world rather than be at home. So I joined everything that I could join just because every one of those things required me to do something out of the house. But I will tell you that money itself drove me for a long time. And, and I'm not sure that was really helpful for my personal life. Uh, I think it caused me to be a terrible workaholic. Now, my wife would say that I am still a workaholic as I get up at three to four in the morning and, and break for lunch with her and then 
break for dinner. Uh, she knows I love what I'm doing. She she supports what I'm doing. There's a lot that we do beyond just doing podcasts and writing articles. And and um, but it took a long time for for me to get to the point where uh, I was at peace over my money. Um, and, and like I mentioned earlier, I was always afraid. I was always afraid of the bad thing that was happened would happen when I went around the next corner. That made me a very conservative investor personally. Hmm. Uh, it also made me a pretty conservative advisor, which probably wasn't all bad, uh, but it might've been good for my clients if I had been a little more aggressive in hindsight, but you know, it, it, it was what it was. But I can tell you now that I feel like I have everything together in terms of, of money and freedom. Uh, I'm a great believer in working, if you can and if you like it, beyond having enough. I purposefully worked until I had, uh, let's say, more than twice what I really needed. I don't live a high life. No. I live a high enough life. I'm not complaining, but but it's it's not the life of, of a rich man. I, I I still consider myself to be frugal, but I we the first day of each year, the business day, we take out five percent of the portfolio, and that's what we get to spend for that year, and and give, uh, and uh, uh, and I'm totally at peace with that. I have no fear of running out of money before I run out of life. So let's switch gears a bit and jump into some more technical things. Uh, we welcomed some unbelievable academics this year who shared a ton of great information. Adriana Robertson had has a such an interesting perspective as her research, and I remember commenting this to her when we talked to her, She's at the intersection of law and finance, which is a pretty rare spot to be. And she's a professor of law and finance at University of Toronto. So index funds have soared in popularity over the past decade. So we asked her if she thought there were any issues from a corporate behavior or a stock market uh, function perspective. This question comes up a lot. And I've copied and pasted the, the transcript from this episode with Adriana to answer the question many times, quoting quoting her, of course. Uh, we've asked other people throughout the year too, and the answers were pretty similar across the board. Uh, mm -hmm. But she speaks to the issue with such authority; it's a it's definitely a good perspective. So I'm, I'll say, a little more sanguine about this than some other folks are, uh, mostly because, in my view, again, index fund is not a meaningful category, and so. To say that there's lots and lots of money in index funds tells me essentially nothing about who's controlling anything uh, because those indices are doing all sorts of different things. So to the extent that you're worried, and I think this conversation, because it happens a lot in academia and in the popular press to some extent as well, misses the fact that there's two different things going on here. There is the growth of the kind of the so-called titans uh, some people call them uh, of Wall Street or just the big three asset managers. But if you're worried about the big three asset managers, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, they have a ton of AUM that's not in index funds, right? So that's really not a story about indices. That's just a story about really large asset managers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe you're worried about that. That's one story. Then there's a story about, well, you know, more than half of AUM in domestic equities is now in so-called passive or index funds. And so we worry about that. Uh, but of course, then the question is, well, what are those indices actually doing? Uh, that's a very different problem to have in your mind. So I have not yet been persuaded that either of those two distinct things are really a problem, but it's certainly the case that both are huge changes in the capital markets and they're something to pay attention to. Uh, but no, I'm not sort of terrified that it's going to destroy liquidity in the markets or it's going to uh, mean that you know we don't have price efficiency anymore or corporate governance has gone out the window. Uh, none of those things, I think, yet. 
I haven't seen any evidence to make me worry. Index investing as a concept hinges on market efficiency. In an efficient market, prices reflect available information, and trying to beat the market, if it's efficient, is a losing game on average. So another great guest was Professor Jay Ritter, who is a scholar at the University of Florida. So he joined us and had a great answer to the question of whether the stock market is efficient. And then he links this to the bad behavior of the average investor. Uh, yes and no. Um, uh, as uh, one of my former professors, Eugene Fama, has said, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, the efficient markets <laughs> hypothesis uh, can be a useful way of thinking about things, but that doesn't mean that it's perfectly correct. You know, I wouldn't be shorting Tesla if I thought that the stock market was completely efficient. Uh, and uh, you know, during the internet bubble period, I, I thought uh, tech stocks were ridiculously overvalued. There, there was 100% certainty in my mind that a bubble was going on. Uh, and I was right. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know when the turning point would be, uh, just like today. Uh, nobody knows uh, where the turning points will be. Uh, but but uh, a problem for most individuals when they try and time the market is they do things exactly wrong. Uh, people tend to chase past returns. So they invest in real estate after real estate prices have gone up. They invest in tech stocks after tech stocks have gone up. Maybe they'll continue to go up for a while. But on average, uh, chasing past returns has, has proven to be the wrong strategy. But that's the strategy that most investors follow. We also asked Professor Hirsch Sheffrin if the market is efficient. And as you might guess, based on him being in the behavioral uh, finance world, he gave us an emphatic no as the answer to the question. But he did say that you should treat the market as if it is efficient even if he doesn't believe that it is. And I thought that was a, a very useful insight for people to hear. Yes, so, um, at, so at the end of Beyond Green and Fear, I, I talk about you know, the lessons, the takeaways. Um, and the, the lessons for most investors, not all investors, but for most investors, is from a financial wealth generation perspective, Act as if mark invest as if markets are efficient, even though they're not. If you're a, if you're in it for the long term, you want to be careful not to outsmart yourself, because there are two counterbalancing forces at work because of behavioral issues. The first is markets are not fully efficient. And so there are theoretical profit opportunities. And the second is you can be the victim of your own behavioral biases. And if the biases are stronger than the potential for alpha, you will be sorry in the long run. Most people will be sorry. One of the other things that I've heard people say about market efficiency is that an efficient market can't possibly be so volatile. Why are prices bouncing around if, if the market is efficient? We asked Professor John Cochran why the value of stocks relative to their fundamentals bounce around so much. <laughs> well, he asked a good question there. Um, so why do prices change? This is one about uh, facts, not about opinions. So th there's a lot of study. I'm going to try to summarize 30 years of research in, in uh, two sentences here. Um, why does the stock's price go up? Big question. Um, now, there's there's two possibilities. One one is the stock's price goes up because everybody understands that the future dividends, the future cash flows, the prices, you know, that, that there's more money coming <laughs> later on. But there's another possibility, which is the price goes up, and uh, I, I'm I'm being careful here about the cause word, <laughs> that the price will come back down again. In other words. Uh, so if we look at this through a present value formula, the price is up corresponding to a lower discount rate, not to a higher set of future cash flows. Uh, but I, I want to, you know, give, we don't really, the, the empirical work establishes the fact, but not the causality. 
<clears throat> so, um, and, and you also said ratio. So prices go up when dividends go up <laughs> and prices go up when earnings go up. We know that. Uh, but does price relative to current earnings uh, go up? Does that mean that future earnings are gonna be even higher than current earnings? And for the market as a whole, the answer is pretty much no, that higher prices relative to current earnings correspond to lower returns in the future. So I take a, a view, I, I work on economic models where, where the causality is lower risk premiums, lower expected returns cause the price to go up, but the facts are consistent with fads and fallacies and bubbles, if you'd like, that the higher prices are the cause and the lower future returns are the effect. But let's not overstate it. It is for the market as a whole and, and current relative to current earnings, individual stocks have a lot of that uh, feature. So a lot of high prices relative to whatever you want are a reflection of or associated with lower returns going forwards, uh, but less so than the market as a whole. So there's more evidence for individual stocks that higher prices relative to current earnings means that earnings will grow in the future. So I hope I didn't go on too long, but uh, you asked a big question. <laughs> the answer to the question that we asked John is that discount rates change in response to risk effectively, which causes prices to change, relative prices to change. This is an empirical finding that was a pretty big deal. And it was the focus of John's 2011 presidential address to the American Finance Association. He kind of rattles it off and, and makes it seem like it's a pretty basic thing, but the discovery the empirical discovery that discount rates cause price variation uh, is a pretty big deal. Now, in an efficient market, index investing makes sense, uh, as, as we've mentioned, but discount rates, which is another way of saying expected returns, on some types of stocks are higher than others. The market cap weighted index naturally has a lot of exposure to stocks with low discount rates. And there's a ton of money in market cap weighted indices, just a ton. I mean, it's such a big part of the, the whole Vanguard message, right? So we asked Rob Arnott to talk about some of the drawbacks of cap-weighted indexing. Absolutely. Well, firstly, cap-weighting is a perfectly good answer. Um, you own the market for all of its um, uh, good features and bad features. Uh, the turnover is nice and low. The costs, the fees are negligible. Um, uh, and so you capture the return of the market, which is great. Um, but you also chase every fad and bubble that comes along. You also underweight every stock that <clears throat> is uh, uh, trading at uh, apocalypse lows. <laughs> and <clears throat> you also miss out on uh, rebalancing alpha. We all think it makes sense to rebalance with our asset allocation if stocks have soared, trim your stocks, top up a little bit on the bonds, and yet doing it within the equity portfolio doesn't happen with indexing. Um, cap weighting's biggest Achilles heel is that any stock that's overpriced, by which I mean a stock that is priced above what the future truly has in store for it, something you can't know, and that is destined to underperform is above its fair value weight in the portfolio. And every stock that's below its fair value weight is destined to outperform and vice versa. So the implication is you're overweight, the overvalued, underweight, the undervalued. This criticism was leveled at index construction way back in 1957 when S&P launched the S&P 500. Um, but uh, it, it was easily refuted by the index um, providers by, by saying, yeah, but that's absolutely true, but you don't, can't tell me which is which. Mm -hmm. And that is accurate. But if you're overweight, the overvalued and underweight, the undervalued, most of your portfolio will underperform. Too little will outperform. So you have a performance drag. We can use the information in prices to make portfolios that differ from the market cap weighted index in a way that leads to higher expected returns. And this is an idea that many of our listeners know by now is generally referred to as factor investing. And it's safe to say that factor investing is becoming pretty popular for yeah, good reason. For we sure. talk about it a lot. We spend a ton of time on factors and we do believe they can add value to one's uh, you know, own investment experience. But does the industry, and this is a good question, does the industry oversell factor funds? 
So we put that question to Rob Arnott as well. The narrative is these factors all work. They've all been vetted by academia and proven to be effective. No, they've been proven to be effective in back tests. Um, these factors all work at different times. Yes, true. Therefore, combining them means you're going to smooth your ride. You'll have less jarring drawdowns, less extravagant wins. Yes. But the drawdowns are not diminished as much as you might hope because the drawdowns are often correlated. The cliche on Wall Street is, is that the only thing going up in a market crash is correlation. So that's a worrisome component. And the final part of the sales pitch is these all work historically over long periods of time. They work at different times. So if you blend them, you have near certainty of winning if you're patient over a three to five year span. No, you don't have near certainty. You have odds modestly in your favor. So correctly positioned, um, multi-factor is a very useful concept that's uh, uh, egregiously overhyped. Rob made factor investing sound uh, not, not so great, which, which is actually an important point. Uh, we don't want to oversell factors either. It's, uh, it's not all that special, but Rob's point is, is perfect. A factor tilted portfolio gives you odds modestly in your favor of an improved outcome, which is, that's, that's actually pretty good. It's not magical. It's not that special, but it, it, it's pretty great, especially for a long-term investor. So we got to meet uh, Vanguard's Antonio Pica, another great guest. And so we asked him what some of the drawbacks are of a factor-based strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, and I, I know we value you clearly seeing it. You are taking active risk. So you, there is a good chance that you can underperform even for a protracted period in time. So you have to be ready to stomach that underperformance and willing to stay the course. Um, again, it goes back to the fact that this is an active form of active investing and any active investing is, uh, um, you know, can lead to underperformance over periods of time and it's cyclical, right? I mean, value, value almost by definition is cyclical, right? Because uh, you're exactly compensated for uh, uh, your potential underperformance in periods when in, in periods like slowdown or contraction, where investors are the most averse to losses. But it's exactly that understanding that you can underperform in periods of time when you don't like it, that compensates you for uh, the risk that you are taking. Um, so again, there's a lot of education and understanding that you need before you can be a successful factor investor. Mm -hmm. So you heard what Antonio said. We have to remember that factor investing is a lot like selling insurance. By buying, for example, value stocks, you're selling insurance to people who are unwilling or unable to bear risk in bad economic conditions. Now that implies that you are willing and able to, to do so. We asked John Cochran how an investor might decide if they should own value stocks. Well, there used to be a good answer for this back when there was a value risk <laughs> uh, which I, is still uncontent. I mean, it's just, it's done badly in the last 10 years. And in some sense, uh, value that 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 means uh, yeah, that that means it, when they said it was a risk, not a not a perpetual alpha, they were right. They, you know, there's a risk yeah. as well. Um, certainly, when you look at the value stocks, it correlates very much with things that feel like risk. So th this was back in the days when there was a reliable value premium. I'll tell you my story for the value premium and who should invest in it. Uh, I, I would uh, start my MBA class on the value stocks by saying, value premium, look, isn't this wonderful? Uh, we'll look at this wonderful alpha, let's all invest. And they say, yeah, let's all invest. Then I would get out a list of what the value stocks were. <laughs> and you would see railroads, you would see Sears Roebuck, <laughs> you would see you know, company after company on the verge in old dying industries on the verge of bankruptcy or very low price, you know, just churning out steel mills, churning out earnings uh, at a very low price, no growth opportunities, no sexiness, very little trading, no information content in these industries, you know, whereas the opposite, of course, is the, the, 
the Googles or the Yahoos, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, all the sexy ones. And then I'd say, okay, who wants to buy these stocks? And you gotta be kidding. I'm not buying that junk over there. I'm buying the sexy stuff over here. I'd say, well, there's the value premium. <laughs> now, uh, that does, looking at it gives you some sense of, you know, there was a strong economic difference between the value stocks and the growth stocks. So you could tell a story about um, people not holding the value stocks. Professor Cochran also offered up a powerful tool for assessing whether you should invest in anything other than the market portfolio, uh, the, the average investor theorem. And the theory is the average investor holds the value-weighted portfolio of all assets. Before we get to what are the most important sources, let me repeat your question at great length, <laughs> okay. because I think there's a deep insight there. Uh, most people thinking about the market think only, well, um, do I want to buy or do I want to sell? Do I think the price is going up or the price is going down? Uh, is this a risk I want to take and, and I don't want to take? It's a very hard uh, question to answer. But you should always, uh, any, anytime someone wants to sell you something, you should ask yourself, what does he know that I don't know? Why is he selling? Now, most people think he's selling because a moron and I'm smarter than he is. But he thinks he's the smart one and you're the moron. So one of you is wrong. This is a theorem. One of you is wrong. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, how do you get around that, uh, that conundrum? And, and that's, so you, you mentioned it very quickly, but let me just take a deep breath. The average investor holds the market portfolio. The average investor must hold the market portfolio. That's just the definition. The average is the average. Uh, all the children can't be above average as Garrison Keillor, uh, famously, uh, famously said, uh, well, he said the opposite and it was a joke. <laughs> Uh, now that means if you are, if you look, you know, honestly uh, in the mirror and say, I'm not any smarter than average, I'm not any, um, I don't have any better than average ability to hold risks or analyze the economy, then you can just, you should hold the market portfolio. And in fact, um, anything but holding the market portfolio is a zero sum game. So uh, investing in general is a wonderful thing to do because it's not a zero sum game. So I, I think before anybody is going to consider implementing a factor investing strategy, you have to do what Professor Cochran said. You have to ask yourself, how are you different from average? And you might have a safer income stream from your job that lets you take on a little bit more risk that other investors mm -hmm. can't take. Or maybe you're just more psychologically risk tolerant. But either way, if you want to invest in risky assets, you're going to have to be able to, to stick to it. And I think this also extends to concentration versus diversification. We tend to say that more diversified portfolios are better, but who are we, who are we really to make that judgment call? Some people might want more concentrated portfolios and the characteristics that come with them. And again, it comes back to that question of people asking themselves who, who they are and, and how they're how they're different from, from average. So we asked Professor Cam Harvey under what circumstances he thinks somebody might actually want to have a concentrated portfolio. Yes. Wow. So, so it, it, it is completely, so people say, oh, well, um, you shouldn't have a concentrated portfolio because you're not diversified. But people don't understand the concept of diversification. And, and this is, again, remarkable to me that there's a few things that people in finance think that everybody understands. And one of those concepts is diversification. And it really depends upon your preferences and you need those preferences to be over, not just variance. So if it is variance, then it, it doesn't make any sense not to diversify because you get rid of a lot of risk in diversification. However, if you've got a preference for skew, then you might have to take what appears to be an undiversified portfolio to get that, to get that profile that you want uh, in terms of the upside. So, uh, so those criticizing the concentrated portfolio just don't understand the concept of diversification in the broader sense, where you're looking at diversification, not just uh, in terms of variance, but in, in terms of higher moments also. Then we asked Bill Schulteis, should investors tilt for factors or stick with market cap indices? And also what he thought people needed to do to stick with their strategy. 
Well, I would say, what is diversification? Diversification is owning different dimensions or different asset classes that may move dissimilar in the short run, if not the long run. I would show them, and we do show people data from 2000 to 2008, and we say, hey, the decision is yours. But whatever you choose, you have got to have the confidence that you're going to stick with it when it's working against you. And more often than not, people say, hey, I want to be diversified. So most of the time, it's a short discussion. So let's continue with this train of thought about the individual investor's portfolio and how does one decide on their own asset allocation? You know, what factors influence the most in that decision? What was the rationale for the decisions made leading to their asset allocation? So these are the kinds of questions we asked Adriana Robertson. There's a really important empirical question here we just heard a lot of theory from professors uh, Cochran and Harvey, and who, who are two giants in in finance. So their <laughs> to say the least, the, yeah. their perspectives on finance theory are are very important. But what Adriana Robertson's about to tell us about is what what do people actually base their investment decisions on? When you go and ask people making real household level financial decisions, why did you do that? Uh, the the empirical question is whether their actions line up with the theory? Yeah, so uh, as you know, we've got all these theories in the literature. And so what my co-author, uh, James Choi, and I decided to do was we would just sort of like ask people what's important to them. Um, and so some of the ones that rose to the top were and are uh, important theories in the sort of the academic literature, like rare disasters. So people worry about sort of a, a crash and that's something that, that has both theoretical academic foundation and did really well uh, in the survey. Some of the other ones that did really well are things like fixed cost of market participation. So it turns out that about half of the people in our sample who have no equities say it's because, you know, just basically it's not worth it. I don't have enough money to invest to make it worthwhile uh, mm -hmm. to go and you know, set up the brokerage account and figure out what to buy and all that's just, it's just not worth it for me. Um, other things are number of years until retirement was really important to people, risk of illness or injury. One of the ones, and that, that risk of illness or injury, it's hard to square with a lot of the academic literature. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, if you've talked to a human recently, it's probably not that surprising to you. And I think that's sort of the biggest thing that came out of this was, if you're trying to explain this to like your mother-in-law, she's going to look at you like, why are you surprised by this? But if you try to map it onto some of the academic literature, it doesn't always fit very well. Uh, and so that I think is the biggest thing that came out of it to me. That and the fact that, again, in the literature, in the theory literature, we have this idea in our mind of kind of the representative investor. And if we could just find which model accurately captures what the representative investor is doing, it's kind of like one thing out there. And that's what it is. Uh, nah. Again, if you've talked to a human, <laughs> not going to surprise you so much when I tell you that turns out that lots of things matter to different people. So if the academic literature doesn't map that well with how people make real life decisions, we have to wonder whether premiums like the equity risk premium are really risk premiums at all. So we asked her, Sheffron, whether this matters to portfolio construction. No, not, not, not if, not if you are, not if you uh, simply take the perspective that I just know that over the long term, there's a actually a decent equity premium. Yep. I don't know whether it's whether what extent it's behaviorally driven or fundamentally driven, and I'm not smart enough to figure it out. Yeah. But the historical track record tells me that it's a it's a good bet, but it's still a bet. It could go the other way, but it's a good bet to in, in, invest as if the market's efficient and then just let it let it run and wait and wait for the returns and ride the roller coaster and don't you know have the discipline not to get discouraged in the middle when uh, when things look absolutely terrible um then the the, the the odds are are you know in our favor that that the returns in the long run will be will, will be de will be decent so one of the debates i can recall having and this is probably going back 20 25 years in the office was whether factor investing was being active such a taboo word was that being active or not so the definition i used to use for active was anything that was predictive or 
subjective, I call it active. I now have a greater appreciation for other definitions of what active are, but that's what we use way back when, or at least I use way back when. You got to remember when it comes to factor investing that implementation is is huge, huge in, in the the product actually capture, capturing the the premiums that they're that they're pursuing. And today, lots of factor products like Avantis, uh, Vanguard, Dimensional, they're using for their ETFs. They're using the active ETF structure, and I think people see active and they you know. <gasps> Gas, right? Oh no, it's it's active. I don't want to invest in this thing because we've been conditioned that passive market cap weighted index funds are good, and everything else is bad. Right. So, for clarification on this, we asked uh, Vanguard's head of factor investing, Antonio Pica, why factor investors should want to be active. And really, active now means to be different than the market. At least I mean, that's one case, definition that makes sense to me. It, it, for sure, it, it, it is. In the case of the ETFs, it means more frequent implementation, right? Yeah. Like an index fund is tracking index that reconstitutes quarterly or reconstitutes semi-annually, which is okay if you're tracking a market cap weighted index because it's not going to change that much. But if you're trying to capture value or momentum is maybe an even more obvious example. Yeah. If the index is reconstituting once, twice, a year, maybe even a few times a year, that might not be enough to capture the the premiums. And we, we talked to Antonio quite a bit about this, and they've got a paper out uh, looking at rebalancing frequency, and they found, as you might expect, or maybe you wouldn't, I don't know, but they found that <laughs> they found that more frequent rebalancing uh, captures more of the of, of the premiums or generates bigger bigger cap M alphas. So that's what he means when he's talking about active. It's like frequency of implementation for sure i mean listen a, a couple of things that first um this idea of active uh, that has a bad connotation uh, might be potentially changing because now you see many more active etfs coming into the market and when we launched these as active etfs we totally faced the same conversation People were like, why do you label as active? That's a bad connotation. Uh, we made the choice very deliberately because when it comes to delivering a strong and consistent exposure to the factor, you want to have the flexibility of rebalancing um, not on a schedule, right? You don't want to be tied to a schedule like every, every six months because within six months, your exposure to the factor can change completely. So over six months, your exposure to a factor like value or momentum will decay meaningfully. Uh, so if you are able to rebalance a little bit over time, and what people get um, most of the time, they get confused with is that they believe that because it is active, it, it needs to have more turnover. All right, so we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna go pretty deep on factors for a second here. <laughs> on, a, on a nuanced topic that, that I don't think gets a whole lot of attention, we, we asked Professor Brad Cornell uh, to disentangle the concept of a factor from a characteristic. Well, here, here's the way I understand it. Let, let, let's take a specific example, like uh, stocks with high P.E. ratios. That's certainly a characteristic. You could sort stocks that way and you'd say, here, here are the high P.E. stocks. And then you could examine whether or not they have higher returns than, than other stocks. But the, the factor pricing theory is that this price earnings ratio is a systematic factor that reflects some sort of underlying risk is the way Fama and French put it when they first developed this approach. And therefore, it, it, it earns a risk premium by nature of that underlying risk, whereas as a characteristic, it, it may or may not be associated with any premium. So the, the following question is whether the difference between a factor and a characteristic matters from the perspective of portfolio implementation. Well, it's even more important, I think, from the perspective of investing, too. If it is a risk premium, as Fama and French say, then it's going to be permanent unless the risk somehow goes away. So you would expect to earn it. But it is not in any sense a beating the market premium. 
you're simply paying for risk. I mean, in the same way, if you hold the S&P 500 instead of treasury bills, you're paying for risk. So from an asset pricing theory, that's the way it works. A lot of people sell funds on the grounds that they're going to invest in these factors and they make it sound like they're going to be beating the market. That is actually more like a characteristic saying we've discovered some stocks that tend to be under or overpriced and we're going to invest in them or, or short them. So it's a very important distinction and it's not appreciated and it's not much understood outside academia. So the key there is that the factors are not a free lunch. It is not alpha. It is compensation for taking risk. Yeah, and it's tricky too, right? Because it, that's true if, if you believe that you're factor investing, uh, but you might not. You might say, well, no, I'm going after the characteristics and it is alpha. <laughs> so that's a, it make, makes it all pretty messy. Uh, J- John Cochran alluded to the value risk premium not showing up for about a decade. Some people have said for a whole bunch of different reasons. I mean, m- more than I could list that the value premium is structurally dead and that this time is different for value and it's it's not coming back. So we asked Rob Arnott, who is entrenched in value investing, uh, we asked him if this time is different for value. Well, certainly it is because we've never had a drawdown this long or this deep. Uh, even the tech bubble, um, the people think of the tech bubble as a the decade of the 90s. Now, it was really 97 to 2000. It was three years. Yep. And so um, value underperformed growth by 4,000 basis points using the Fama French methodology, using price to book. Um, It got it back in the space of 14 months after the low. Uh, It got the whole thing back. Um, So the snapbacks can be profound but uh, it was a horrible drawdown, a little under three years. And this one, no matter how you cut it, is uh, at least three and a half, and by some measures, 13 years. Um, and it's deeper. The uh, value underperformed growth by 40% in the tech bubble, and by 58% using price to book from 2007 to 2020. But here's what's interesting. The value effect has worked just fine the last uh, dozen years. Now, that sounds like a radical, preposterous statement. Here's what I mean. Value has gotten cheaper relative to growth by a larger magnitude than its performance drawdown. Right. So let's say you have a stock that fell 58%, like value relative to growth. Let's say the stock's price to book value fell 68%. Are you going to look at, that means the book value has risen. Mm -hmm. Are you going to look at that and say, get me out of here. I can't stand the pain. Many investors would say that. But if they looked at at the drop in price to book value, they might say, I can't believe how cheap this is. It's the cheapest ever. It's cheaper than it was during the tech bubble. Let me at least rebalance in and if I can possibly persuade my clients to do so, let me over rebalance and overweight value at this stage. And we also asked David Booth, the founder of Dimensional Fund Advisors, if he thought it was different this time for value stocks. Well, every time is different. So in that sense, there's nothing different here because it's different this time. It's different every time. <laughs> uh, I think people get confused. Uh, for example, um, uh, we've used price to book primarily as our way of determining value. You know, the people use price to cash flow or and all of those things are fine because um, it's not about the accounting variable. You're, you're just trying to buy low price stocks. Mm-hmm. And it's a tautology to say the lower the price you pay for something, the higher your eventual return. You know, so it's, there's a, um, there's a lot of common sense associated with, uh, with the value uh, story. Um, that being said, we, you know, we've gone through, you know, a, a difficult time with value. Um, all investment styles will go through long periods of time when the results are disappointing. That's the nature of the stock market. The reason being, here again, starting with FAMA's, it was actually FAMA's dissertation in the early 60s, 
where we learn for the first time that the distribution of stock returns has fat tails. And by fat tails, meaning they're more extreme events than you would expect if things were normally distributed. Um, and you have, you know, unusually good returns sometimes, like the last nine months. <laughs> uh, and you have unusually horrible returns, uh, you know, too often, like in the first three months. <laughs> You know, it's not that easy to find someone who has had skin in the game for this long, managing the same type of strategies. I mean, value for David Booth for for many years. So his perspective on this is so valuable. Well, they've been managing a dimensional factor portfolios for over 40 years. So we, we asked David what they've learned over that kind of time frame with respect to factor investing. In the 80s due to performance, you know, it wasn't all... Uh, it wasn't a lot of fun, but the people that stayed with it um, got amply rewarded. <laughs> um, and I think that's the way to think about it. You know, five years from now or 10 years from now, what, when you want to, as you look back on returns and, and you want to say, look, oh yeah, we had a nasty three year period for value. So we got out. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, everything points to, um, you know, if, if, you, if you look at fundamental values like P.E. ratios or price to book ratios, this looks like uh, the expected premium is unusually high uh, for a value. Um, I'm not forecasting. Oh, no. you know, wipe my mouth out with soap if, uh, <laughs> if, I, if you heard me forecasting. No, no, we know that. <laughs> yeah. So let's pose a question to Antonio Peak of Vanguard to find out how he responds when investors express concern about the value premium going away? I, I, I guess we asked a lot of people if uh, if value is dead this year. <laughs> well, it comes up enough, right? And we yeah. have such great people to ask that question to. Uh, the best people. So I, Antonio is, of course, at the helm of Vanguard's Factor Strategies. And in, in hindsight, they were launched at probably the worst possible time. In hindsight, and nobody knew that was going to happen. But Factor performance has been terrible since they launched these these products that are targeting uh, the, the factors. I mean, value value being probably the worst the worst offender. So I think Antonio is in a really good position to talk about how he has been sticking with these strategies, and he's been getting Vanguard to stick with it too. Like he's he's leading this thing, and there there's likely I think he mentioned this in the in the full version of this episode. There's people within Vanguard that still need a little bit of convincing as well. It goes back to the point we were discussing before about valuations, right? And I'm not the only one making this point, but we've been looking at it all along. Like Rafi has been making the same point. AQR has been making the same points, which is, yeah, it's true. Value is getting, uh, the underperformance of value has, uh, uh, has been getting worse, right? It rebounded uh, over the last year, right? But at the same time, the, the valuation discount with respect to the market was getting wider. So you expect that at some point to to mean reverse. It would be a completely different consideration if uh, um, value stocks were getting crushed and were also staying uh, relatively comparable in terms of valuations relative to the market. And at that point, you know that you pretty much have lost uh, the money. But no, that's not the case, actually. Just telling you that the there is even stronger opportunity today in value than there was uh, a few years ago, and you you need a long term focus because it will mean revert. But valuations are a terrible indicators of of uh, when to time, right? Because they can be dislocated for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, they are a good indicator about the opportunity. Um, so you can you can look at them from that perspective. We believe it's going to happen. We don't know when. Of course, it has happened this year. And also, the, the, the important thing is that it has happened exactly for the reasons that we expected, uh, which is value stocks are cyclical. Like you can say whatever you want, but value stocks are cyclical. They tend to do well during uh, early stage recovery and during expansion. What we've seen in the last year has been a recovery. Now, that recovery hasn't been smooth because of continuous conversations around and concerns around um, COVID. Right, and uh, and COVID coming back representing a big headwind to that uh, to that recovery. 
but I think we've just seen the beginning of it and uh, um, there's much more to come. So we were so lucky to also speak with Professor Robert Novi Marx from the University of Rochester. He brings an incredible perspective, I found anyways, on the value premium. So instead of buying the cheapest stocks, you buy companies with higher profitability. So as he explained, it's basically the flip side of value. And it's also, I find, um, more understandable by the end investor. Yeah, definitely more understandable. If you think about value as a standalone factor, so take the the unconditional value premium, just value on its own, it has some problems. Like if you just if you're looking for cheap companies, if you you're just looking at cheapness, you don't know why they're cheap. Right. Are they cheap because they're bad businesses, or are they cheap because they're good businesses with high discount rates? So that's what we asked Professor Novi Marx about. The way academics had been thinking about value, um, it was part of our standard um, asset pricing model, um, but it was all coming from sort of the traditional Benjamin Graham price-based uh, value, where you, you, you buy cheap stocks and you short expensive stocks and you, on average, uh, earn a, a difference in returns between those two because the cheaper stocks have had higher expected returns over time. Um, I, th I think that my paper was sort of incorporating in what I would call Buffett value in some sense. Um, he's sort of repeatedly written in his newsletters about how it was back in the day that Charlie Munger taught him that it was far better to buy a, a wonderful stock at a fair price than to buy a fair stock at a wonderful price. Um, and I sort of viewed um, the, the profitability-based strategies as being that flip side of value um, where when you buy cheap stocks, you get the Benjamin Graham style, but where you buy the high profitability stocks, um, you're getting those wonderful stocks and hopefully at fair values. Um, so I kind of viewed them as, as similar philosophically, where in, in both cases you were trying to get a lot of productive capacity um, at, a, at a good price for what you're getting. Um, but I think in terms of why it was, you know, kind of took off in, in finance is partly because um, while philosophically similar, um, it has a very different sort of investment solution where um, the traditional value strategies, um, a lot of the stocks you buy in them, um, they're good investments, but they don't look like great firms in some way. Um, whereas for the, the profitability strategies, it's a good good investment and you're getting good firms. Um, so it, it actually has a growth tilt, mm -hmm. um, which made it really attractive to value investors as a, as a um, strategy to run in tandem because it tends to outperform when traditional value underperforms and vice versa. So um, they, they tend to smooth out the performance of each other um, and they're just highly complementary. I think they also, um, it, it helps for the academics that they both come out of the value equation. There's, a, there's an economic principle on which we can hang, hang a hat. Um, the fact that we know that prices are, that stock prices are their expected discounted future dividends. Um, and the, the value strategies are, are trying to find um, you, know, you use high dis you use low prices to, to try and identify stocks with high discount rates. Um, but the problem there is that the low price stocks can also be stocks that have low expected future cash flows. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think profitability helps you distinguish between the, the two reasons for low prices. It helps you, you find the stocks that have low prices because they have high discount rates and avoid the stocks that have low prices because they have low expected future dividends. We spent a lot of time talking about stocks, but mo most investors, or, or at least the, the theoretical average investor, own bonds in their portfolio. We talked with Dave Pleka, who's the head of fixed income at Dimensional Fund Advisors, about why people would still want to own bonds in their portfolio today, given things like historically low interest rates. No, I, I don't really think the role has changed. Um, I mean, I, I would start by you know saying, well, what what is the role, and and that's going to be different for different uh, investors. But generally, the role of fixed income is going to have to do something with some sort of risk control, right? I mean, if we are just simply in the pursuit of returns, if we had no view towards risk but just want to returns, well, we know that in the overall scheme of things, equities will have higher returns. So, so the role of fixed income is generally having to do with some risk control. So you think about some of the risk controls, you know, asset liability matching. So you're trying to, you know, control interest rate risk. Well, it's just as good as it's ever been, right? Uh, or from, a stand, from the standpoint of volatility, bringing down the volatility of an equity portfolio, just as good as it's ever been. Now, yes, the expected returns are, are lower, but 
you know, I always like to turn the focus onto, onto the premiums, right? So the when we look at, you know, any asset pricing model, we, we start with a risk-free rate, uh, plus we add some premiums, you, you know, presumably for, for taking risk. That's true for the equity uh, uh, asset pricing models as well. Well, we're all starting with the same risk-free rate. So in some sense, we're all in the same boat, a low risk-free rate. Uh, our premiums in fixed income, expected premiums are in line with historical premiums. But like I say, we're just in a low interest rate world, which affects all financial assets. So many investors are aware of the factors of higher expected returns in stocks. However, so many people are not aware of the factors of higher expected returns in fixed income. So who better to ask for an explanation than Dave Pleca? So the well, the the two uh, that we've uh, identified as primary drivers of fixing returns, term and credit, uh, those are not controversial. They're certainly not meant to be controversial. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Like, so you pick out a uh, a single issuer, let's say the Canadian uh, uh, government, and you look at Canadian government bonds, and you form portfolios of short-term bonds or intermediate-term bonds and long-term bonds, and you you let them run through time, and you see differences in returns. Well, you know, it's the same issuer across the whole spectrum. Well, obviously, it's the difference in term that's driving, the, you know, the difference in returns. And or, or you could go the other uh, on the the other axes. You could say, well, I'll hold a bunch of five-year bonds. They're all the exact same term. Some of their government bonds, and some are single A bonds, and some are triple B bonds. And you could see differences in return along that axis as well. So, term and credit uh, are the main drivers of returns. Uh, we, our our research all shows that. In the end, the current price of the security is is uh, reflecting all the available information. There's information about those expected premiums that we could get from the current price. It's pretty obvious when you hear it. Bonds still bring down volatility in a portfolio. And even though the risk-free rate is low, there are still factor premiums in fixed income. So time for a little bit of a pivot. One of the favorite books for me this year was Dopamine Nation by Dr. Anna Lemke from Stanford. And I, I thought this topic was particularly timely given all the issues around social media and Facebook and TikTok and all that goes with it. Um, at the heart of a lot of these issues is the dopamine that's being created in our current environment. So we had a chance to ask Dr. Lemke how dopamine influences our behaviors on a daily basis. Well, I mean, we are evolutionarily designed to approach pleasure and avoid pain. And it's that's what's kept us alive in a world of scarcity and ever, uh, ever present danger. Um, and pleasure and pain, pleasure and pain work very much like a balance. So imagine that there's a, like a balance in your brain, like a teeter totter in a kid's playground. And when we do something pleasurable or ingest something pleasurable, that balance tips slightly to the side of pleasure and dopamine is released in our brain's reward pathway. But one of the overriding rules governing that pleasure pain balance is that it wants to remain level. It doesn't wanna be tipped for very long to the side of pleasure or pain. And the brain will work very hard to restore a level balance or what's called homeostasis. And it does that by down-regulating dopamine and dopamine transmission right after we get a release of dopamine in the reward pathway. But the really key piece is that it doesn't just downregulate dopamine levels back to tonic baseline. It actually decreases dopamine transmission to below baseline. So there's a dopamine deficit state that occurs in response to a dopamine elevation before dopamine levels go back to baseline. And with the balance, one way to think about this is that you have these little gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again but they like it on the balance, so they stay on until it's tipped an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain before jumping off and before homeostasis being restored. And th that's a really key piece of how pleasure and pain work, that with every pleasure, uh, there's essentially a pain. It's often so subtle that it's outside of our conscious awareness, but it's still ha operating in the brain. It's important information from Dr. Lemke, considering all of the action we saw with Robin Hood and and meme stocks and all of that, uh, all of that gambling-like behavior that we saw throughout the course of this year and and last year. The obvious question that we had to ask Dr. Lemke, especially relevant to to our field, is how the dopamine-rich world that we live in, including the the gambling uh, the gambling situations with stocks that I just mentioned, how does that affect our ability to to make long-term decisions? 
I think it really does. Um, you know, one of my neuroscience colleagues, he did a, a fascinating experiment where he showed that when people are engaging in a, a game or a task that involves short-term rewards, that the part of their brain that lights up most prominently is the limbic brain or the emotion brain, which is exactly where this reward pathway, this pleasure pain balance is, is located. When people are engaging in a task that requires them to think about and anticipate longer term rewards, the part of their brain that lights up most is the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is that big gray matter area right behind our foreheads that's central to delayed gratification, um, future consequences, storytelling, planning. So what that tells us is that we're engaging very different parts of our brain when we are um, anticipating short term rewards versus long term rewards and that short term rewards are especially dangerous because they do primarily engage our emotion brain and when we're just living in emotion brain we're probably not able to truly and objectively see future consequences so i do think that in your work it's very important i would imagine that you help people understand that they need to sit on those decisions you know that this is something that um, they should give it 24 hours. Um, they shouldn't do it impulsively or in the moment, although the pull to do it then is very, very strong, especially again, if you add in the, the social media and the herd mentality factor where you see everybody else piling on. But I really think that there's a huge danger of not really objectively being able to engage the prefrontal cortex to see the true data and the true implication of that choice if we're just working out of our limbic brain. One of the big underlying tones throughout the course of this year, especially the second half of the year, has been inflation. Everybody seems to be worried about inflation. Inflation is, in fact, picking up a little bit, at least as measured by, by CPI. We've, we've covered inflation from a few different angles throughout the course of the year, like well, what should you do in your portfolio? Basically nothing is, is what we found in our, in our analysis. But people are still wondering, is inflation going to explode or, or are we going to have hyperinflation? So we are fortunate to be able to ask Cullen Roach, who's got a, a very uh, pragmatic, practical perspective on money in, in the capitalist economy. We, we were able to ask Cullen his thoughts on where inflation is going. Uh, and I, I, I love his answer. Uh, and we, we also talked a little bit about whether the money printing, in, in air quotes, money printing, whether that's a cause for concern with respect to inflation. You know, that's probably one of the most, I think, disconcerting things about kind of my evolution and education of macroeconomics is that I've learned that nobody knows what the hell causes inflation, um, which is crazy because you know there's lots of theories about it and the general theory is that more money chases more goods and you know that we've kind of discovered over time that it's more it's a lot more complex than that you know the money supply has increased by any measure you know really significantly in the last you know year or the last ten years and especially by any traditional sort of measure and so but we haven't had really high inflation which was surprising to a lot of people and I think that. What we're finding out is that a lot of these other things matter a lot more than people believe. You know, technology trends matter. The demographic trends matter a lot. Um, you know, so you have all these big other sort of secular trends that are occurring that um, make this a lot harder to analyze than this sort of generalization that more money will mm -hmm. chase more goods and therefore you'll get inflation. And Okay, let's do another shift over to a retirement discussion. So author and former Russell Investments executive Don Ezra brought some pretty cool perspective to retirement. So Don is interesting in that he has spent his career studying retirement. He's written about it, and now he's living it. In his book, Life 2, he suggested that the experience of not knowing what you want to do in retirement is not uncommon. So we asked him what he thought people could do to change that. From my experience, one of the things you need to do is prepare. <laughs> so you need to start thinking about it 
at least a couple of years before you plan to retire, possibly more, possibly five years, because with some of the statistics I've seen in the States and the UK, about half of retirements take place earlier than the retiree wants. It's unexpected early wow. retirement. Um, it could be because something happens to your employer. It could be redundancy. It could be illness, either your own or someone you have to look after. But all of a sudden, things happen and you have no idea about it. So the earlier you start thinking about it, the better. I mean, these should be the happiest days of your life. It's, it's awful to get it off to a negative start. So can you talk about the U-curve of happiness and its relationship <laughs> to the typical retirement age? Yeah, um, with pleasure, because that's where I am right now. And, and it, 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 it's interesting, if you, if you record the happiness ratings that people give themselves, and this is a very personal thing, but if you record that and average it over the population in a country, in every country you look at, by age, it ends up with a U-curve. So it starts off very high. And then gradually it's by 20, age 20, when you know nothing, but you're filled with adventure and you're gonna put the world to rights. And then gradually as you experience real life and nothing quite works out the way you want. I mean, there are still some huge pleasures, but, but perfection is tough to reach. And it starts going down. It tends to go down to somewhere on average in the age range, 45 to 50. And then it starts climbing again by the time you're 70. It's higher than it was even when you were 20. So it, it just keeps going, going on and on. In fact, when, 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 I, when I investigated this and studied it, I ended up writing, writing a book that I called Happiness. The best is yet to come because the peak of the curve is, is at the end. So no matter what age you are, there's, there's, uh, your best years are still in the future. Um, and and this, is, this has nothing to do with retirement, even though it's those retirement years at the end. This has to do purely with brain chemistry. So we heard from Don Ezra that a lot of people don't really know what they want to do in retirement, and that can be a little bit of a problem. One of the things that we talked about with Dr. Anna Lemke is that more, more people are, are going to have more free time just, just, on based, just based on where technology is going and, and where the economy is going. People have more leisure time. So people don't know what they're going to want to do in retirement. People have more leisure leisure time, generally speaking, as technology gets better, like we mentioned early on in this episode, people will have more time. But people need to understand that that can actually be detrimental. People need to be aware of the possible issues that can come with too much free time. So we asked Dr. Lemke what people are going to do with all this free time. Great question. I think that we haven't yet figured out how to handle all of the time that we have. So not only are we seeing increases in leisure time, so the average person today has, I think, something like four to five hours of leisure time per day. Um, you know, in 100, 150 years ago, it was more like one or two hours a day. And at that time, there were people who had no leisure time, right? People who worked 24 seven, people who, who worked and lived in slavery. Um, in 2025 or 2050, we're projected to have even more leisure time, or some seven or eight hours of leisure time today. People talk about the universal basic income that we would give people an income such that they wouldn't have to work at all and they could have a, you know, a subsistence living. The problem is that we need to be much more thoughtful about how we're using this leisure time. Because as of right now, it looks like we're mainly using it to consume highly rewarding feel good drugs and behaviors. Um, so one, you know, one statistic that was really powerful for me is that we've seen an exodus of young men out of the workforce. There are fewer young men employed and working today than in m many prior generations. And um, what they're mostly lost to is video games. So we, we really have this situation where people are working less, but they're, they don't know what to do with that extra time. And they're, many of them are, are using that time to engage in these highly reinforcing escapist behaviors that ultimately I think will make them very unhappy and that are fundamentally um, addictive. So I'm concerned, you know, I'm concerned. Also, you know, we're living longer, right? I mean, the average human lived to about age 30 for most of human existence now we're living on average to age 80 so we've got more time on any given day we've got more days 
Um, I'm seeing more and more people in retirement coming in with new onset addiction of all sorts. People who could drink alcohol in moderation through their whole lives, retire, have all this time, and then all of a sudden drinking all day long and then cross that physiologic threshold, um, get dependent, experience withdrawal, um, are really in full, full blown addiction. And of course, the danger there is further that as we age, our brains get less plastic. And so these habits that we, um, you know, sort of are, um, that we're creating later in life, it's, it's harder to undo them. Um, so this is, I think, something we need to collectively really think about. Sometimes it feels kind of funny. Cameron and I are here educating the thousands of people that listen to our podcast about how to manage their finances when that's what we do professionally. And I, I say it's kind of funny because we're providing people with the information that they would need to go and do this themselves. And the products are out there for people to do this themselves fairly easily. Now, meanwhile, we, we still have a reasonably successful business and people are still paying for our services. And I think that's because we do provide a valuable service. Bit of a shameless plug, I guess. Now, we did ask David Blanchett what he thinks financial advisors need to be doing to justify charging a fee in excess of what somebody could pay to mm -hmm. just purchase a, a low cost index fund on their own. So, you know, it's funny, I was, I was talking to a reporter, I don't know, earlier this week, and it was about this idea of like those bogleheads have like the three, uh, the three fund portfolio. It's like um, cash, like a global stock and a global bond. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can give you a, a one fund portfolio. Just go out and buy like the Vanguard balance index, whatever else it is. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I think it's okay. I mean, so again, we have to get paid for what we do. Like, I, you know, I, we all help people do things. We get paid to do it. And I think the, the question is, is like, what is your value proposition? Um, you know, I'm not convinced that advisors are going to add a ton of value by beating the market. Right. And so again, like alpha, I want alpha, I want alpha. Well, if you want alpha versus advisors, invest in an incredibly low cost portfolio. Right. So if you as an advisor can convince a client to own a balanced portfolio of indexes, I would contend that you will, on average, outperform the average advisor because the expenses of your portfolio are lower. Right now, that's not necessarily nearly as sexy as like you know owning 13 mutual funds and allocating to this new emerging markets fund. But yep. what 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 is the objective? The, the 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 key objective at the end of the day is to help someone accomplish their financial goals. Okay, and a huge piece of that is is behavioral. And so, you know, if you can define your role as, hey, I'm going to create a portfolio for you that is very good and very cheap. I'm going to keep you invested in that for the next 20 or 30 years. That could be worth 1% easily if you're doing extra stuff too, if you're doing the financial planning. Right? I think that for better or for worse, our industry has evolved from stock brokerage where you have to pick stocks and beat the market. Well, beating the market doesn't matter if you can't help a client accomplish their goals. And so to me, the focus is on is on doing what it takes to accomplish a goal. And sure, alpha helps. If you can if you can beat the market by 8% a year, like that client's gonna do a spectacular job. The problem is, is like that's a zero sum game before fees. Mm. Everyone can't do that. And so I think that the question is, is how do you define yourself as an advisor? And if you're an alpha guy, I mean, I, it, it's a cool story, I get it, but you know, what is the true impact of that on clients? And are you really adding alpha in the grand scheme of things Maybe, but you know, if you ever pull an audience of advisors and ask them how many don't add alpha, nobody raises their hand. Don Ezra was such a great guest, and I thought this passage was the perfect cap to this episode. Life has so much to offer, and this is what Don calls life's abundance. Um, so much of the of the the interviews and the conversations we had this year do help people lead a better life. So we asked Don to talk about the seven asset classes of the life's abundance portfolio. Oh, yes. And given that it's such a cool concept, I mean, it's been a huge part of my life. And so you can guess that it isn't original in my mind because very few things are original in my mind. I got this from a guy called Ed Jacobson. And I, I, had, I had just retired and I was at a conference speaking and he was speaking. I thought, this sounds like interesting stuff. And he, he was talking to... Uh, financial advisors about how to have how to have useful meetings with your clients and one of the components of the useful meeting was uh, he said I've got this concept called the life's abundance portfolio so think of all the good things in life this is your life's abundance and it's it's your portfolio it's all the holdings you have there and 
divided up into seven pieces. So I, I think of them as seven asset clusters in your portfolio. My geeky friends love the idea about asset clusters in your life's abundance <laughs> portfolio. And I, I can't remember the names that Ed gave to them, but I remember them in pairs. So family and friends, work and play, physical health and mental health at six, or, and money. Yeah, it's the, 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 the one that's on its own is the one we, we we, we think about all the time, but, they're, 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 but it's, it's one, I like the idea that it's one of se seven important things in life. And, and the idea of, of, the, of that is to say, think of your life. Uh, this is an exercise you can go through maybe every fifth year as your, as your age goes up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so think of these seven asset classes, give yourself a score, a personal rating on each one from one to 10. There is no right answer. There is no wrong answer. Nobody's rating except your own is relevant. And so how would you rate yourself on each of them? When you've done that, just think, okay, which are the ones I'm comfortable with? I don't have to have a 10 on everything. I may be only a four on this, but you know, it's less important to me, that's okay. So which are the ones that are okay? And which are the ones where you would like to raise your score? And when you want to raise your score, what is it that is within your power, within your control to raise that score? And that starts giving you a sense of purpose, et cetera, et cetera. And that is what this year has been all about. What we can learn that will help us all raise our score, as Don mentioned. So 2021, we've welcomed unbelievable guests, all of whom have been super generous with their time and all in their own way helped us fill in this matrix that will help us make better decisions. So Ben and I wish you a super holiday season and we thank you for listening and watching for the past year. Thanks again from the entire Rational Reminder team. We wish everyone a great 2022 and we truly appreciate you listening and engaging with us and, and being part of this, this thing that we're creating and, and, can, and plan to continue creating. And we'll see everybody next year. Yeah, definitely. But th thanks again, uh, everyone. Man. I messed it up. <laughs> I'll just say it. They can cut it. They can cut it in. No? Sure. Oh, man. It's coming. Man, if it wasn't, if it was just you doing this podcast, there'd be no cuts. It's always me. <laughs>